it up here. <laughs> All right, hey, welcome to Shoreline. Welcome those of you live on Facebook. And are you ready for another day? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We look outside and we see the beauty of the snow falling and the snow trucks passing while they throw all the salt that they dug out of the ground back onto the ground for us so that we can slip and slush all the way home. But in the meantime, we're going to be warm and we're going to be lifting the name of Jesus high for all to praise him. So this is a good day and I am so grateful that you're here. I'm trying to make sure that I'm staying on task today. Um, we have, for the last two weeks, been talking about marriage, and we're going to continue to talk about it. Um, and at some point in the message today, I'm going to clarify a couple things that I said last week. I had a really cool email from somebody who said, hey, I was listening, and I want to know a couple things. And so if you ever have any questions, you know, you can call, you can talk to me in person, or you can email me, and it really is helpful because sometimes I say stuff and you may hear it one way and <laughs> I'm like, oh my, I didn't mean or intend that. And, um, and so we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through today. Um, but it was, it was a beautiful thing to be asked those questions and to be able to clarify them a little bit further for that person and it'll benefit all of us today. Um, we are going to pray and then I'm going to ask that uh, Tracy and Dawn come up and lead us in worship today. And um, while we're worshiping God, while we're lifting our voices to him, let's try and push away all the stuff you know, the stuff of this week that just kind of clings on us and hangs on us. And, um, and as, as I was talking just a few moments ago, sometimes Sunday morning is the hardest day of the week because it seems like the enemy is fighting against us and sometimes our, uh, I just want to stay in bed, is fighting against us. But um, as that has passed and we're here now, um, Let's go ahead and push away that stuff and focus on the Almighty God who is here with us and he loves us and he cares about us and he wants to see us grow closer to him so that we can experience his love in a greater way. Jesus, I thank you that you came for us on the cross. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent him to die for us on the cross. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you were there giving power and strength to Jesus as he performed ministry here on earth. And Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here with us today. Here with us in all of the struggles. Here with us in all of the joys. Here with us in all of the different um, looks that we're getting on life today. I pray that you would help us to be drawing closer to you. Lord, that our attentions would be focused on you. That all the hurts that we have encountered this week would just kind of either be, be healed by you or would be kind of set aside for this time where we can just be built up and strengthened in relationship with you. And Jesus, I pray that you would um, be with those who are physically not feeling the greatest this morning, some who haven't come because of that, and others who are just kind of feeling slow. Lord, I pray that you would be with those who are on the top of the world. Some great things have happened this week, and they just want to shout from the rooftops all the wonderful things that you've done. And I pray that you would help them to have a spot where they could just share the wonderful things that you've done. And Lord, for those who are somewhere in the middle, I just pray that you would give them a better glimpse of you, help their, their eyes to turn from self to you, and help them to give you glory and honor in whatever situation 
has come their way. And Lord, I praise you. I praise you that we get to be in your presence today. I praise you that we get to be in the presence of each other today. And I praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. To join us, um, just a little comment. Have you ever been in service and the pastor says something and you think, how did he know that about me? Have you ever done that? Yeah, try being the pastor's wife. He already really does know it about me, so that staying in bed, not wanting to get out of bed thing, if you felt like that was directed at you, it might have been directed at me. <laughs> maybe, just maybe. No, no, it wasn't? Okay. It was just a general comment that I might have felt slightly convicted about. we go through this service, we would feel your presence around us. And as we exit those doors, we would feel you with us this week as we have struggles and as we have victories over temptation. Lord, help us to feel you close to us and help us to continue to turn to you. Amen. Thank you. 
We try and be real around here, and uh, one of the ways that we pick songs is which one is Tracy going to cry on, so um, <laughs> she was talking about that this morning, and, and I thought she was going to bring it up. She didn't, so I figured I would. The order of songs, sorry. Yes, so for those of you who couldn't hear her because you're on Facebook, she said we pick the last one as the one she's going to cry on so she doesn't have to cry through both of them. Um, and anyway, there we go. So, life is always going to happen to us. Um, this, this is a, a wonderful life moment right here. This was the day, I believe the day after Tracy and I were engaged. Was it the day after? I thought it was. Um, I, I scheduled this um, because I knew that we were going to get engaged um, and it was just kind of a fun thing that I was n not surprising my wife who doesn't like to be surprised with and um, anyway it was a great day we had some fun times taking pictures and um, the the picture that you see here doesn't show all that the picture you see when you look at us now has involved. So if we were to retake this picture, we would look different both physically but internally. And um, we have lived the, the priorities and the purposes that the church has uh, stated for these last, what, 18 years, Tracy? Almost 19 years. And... Um, this year, the the 2000 or yes, 2003 was was the date of our marriage, and we've tried to live out these priorities and these purposes more clearly as we've gotten closer to Christ. But I just kind of want to bring this up that this it doesn't look the same, right? It starts out fresh and new, and there's some some really cool things that happened in our relationship back then. But there's also some bumps and bruises between then and now. And there's some kids. And there's some, some different church situations. And there's just life between then and now. And in some aspects, we've had to go, oh, God, I'm just worn out. And in other aspects, we've got to go, I'm fired up. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Okay? And in our lives, um, when we go through these priorities, know that today should not look like tomorrow. Tomorrow should be a little closer to God. Tomorrow should be a little closer to each other. Tomorrow should be a little closer to heaven. And so let's keep that perspective going as we go through um, our priorities. Are you ready, Mark? Priority number one is that we connect to Jesus Christ in a life-transforming relationship. And that 
life-transforming relationship isn't just a one-and-done kind of thing. It's an every morning. His mercies are new. His grace is building in us. His favor is walking al- alongside of us. And um, sometimes we really super need it, and sometimes it's just kind of a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. But um, in relationship with each other, priority number two, priority number one really comes important because sometimes our relationships are very rocky, okay? And um, very. And so connecting to each other is not the deepest thing that we want to do. It's not the first thing we want to do. Sometimes we want to run and hide from that. But if we're connecting with Jesus, then we have a basis to connect with each other. And that connection um, can really just develop in us a deeper connection again to Jesus. So um, look around. Everybody look around. Look around. There we go. Okay, you're looking around. And if you're at home, um, just look around the sanctuary here as you, as you kind of look at the back of people's heads. There we go. Okay. So these are the connections that we get to have that will build our relationship closer to Christ. And do you know that some of them will not be pleasant experiences? Okay? Sometimes something that drives me to Christ is because you drive me crazy. Okay? And that's a broad thing. I'm not trying to f- focus anything on my wife right now. All right? Because, you know, she has this, this thing that she just talked about where she feels this conviction. And I forgot that she got up late. So um, just please, please don't feel like I'm aiming at you, Trace. Um, but seriously, sometimes because you drive me crazy, it drives me to my knees. And when I'm on my knees, I'm coming closer to a Christ who wants to make us whole and holy and like himself so that we can survive these moments where you drive me crazy, right? So let's connect to each other so that we can connect to Christ in a greater way. Priority number three, connect to people, um, to a living that does not deviate from God's created intention. So simply, man, every day I find a new way that I need to focus on connecting to a life that does not deviate from God's created intention. Like there's some small, subtle way that God just says, what are you doing right now? What about us? Right? And so I have to go again and say, Jesus, I want to connect to you but here I don't connect very well. And, and, and you're pointing this out to me right now. And sometimes I try and pretend I'm oblivious, hey, right? And just kind of walk on like, Jesus, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear that. And, um, and he calls me to task for that in love because everything that he gives us of himself is so that we can experience love appropriately and most of us have experienced love that hurts love that is not godly love that is drastically different than what his plan was for us and as we experience that um, God draws us back he says this is my perfect love cast out all fear my perfect love is here for you so that you don't have to stumble around in darkness. It will light your path. It will guide your steps. It will care for you as you are hurting. It is patient. It is kind. It doesn't keep record of all your wrongs. Jesus' love draws us to this place where we don't have to feel like everything's disconnected and falling apart and lost and too much. It draws us to a place where he says, I've got something to give you. And he gives us of himself. It's worthy of worship. It's worthy of having a purpose to say, God, you are good all the time. Even when this world brings not good stuff into our presence, God is good all the time. 
He is continually bringing the good that holds this thing together so that we can get to a point of when you drive me crazy and I'm on my knees that I draw closer to Him. It all works together for God to receive the honor that He's due. So everybody say glory to God. That's your purpose. Good. This week, um, I'd like to join with you in prayer, not for some people who drive me crazy, although they probably will at some point, but uh, our our prayer folks of the week are Sam and Christina Robb. And so um, as we go through this week, I'd love you join me in praying for them. Um, It's on your little um, bulletin that you got when you came in. So if you can't remember... It's right up near the top, right underneath the the verses that you're supposed to read every day. Okay? So, um, and it's right under the the two words, this week. Okay? So, let's pray for them now. Let's also pray that uh, God will continue to draw us into his presence today. Jesus, we need you because we have each other. And sometimes that's difficult. Lord, we need you to, to draw our attention away from ourself because, man, so many times we feel like, what about me? Why do I have to always? And God, um, we need to look and say, wow, how great thou art. How great you did all those wonderful acts of service by humbling yourself and lowering yourself to a manger and from a manger walking this life out of the the beauty and splendor and glory of your um, of your heavenly throne and then you humbled yourself to be spit upon and and then nailed to a cross experiencing death that you never deserved death that we deserved so that we didn't have to eternally be separated in death from you. You are so awesome. You are so worthy of our praise. You are so great and mighty. Your power is beyond compare. You are God, and we just need that reminder sometimes. So Lord, as we walk through this week, I pray that you would let those thoughts reverberate through our mind. That you would let us be focused on a holy and awesome God so that we're not as selfish as we tend to be and want to be. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in that new uh, refocusing to be able to be a blessing to those who might be a struggle for us. They might cause us some difficulty and some pain and some hurt. Lord, help us to be able to take that in the name of Jesus so that His name would be lifted up. Lord, I just pray that You would be with our brother and sister, Sam and Christina Rob, that You would bless their week, that You would continue um, to grow and develop their relationship as they seek you and as they as they follow you in in your guidance and direction. I praise you, Lord, for what you've done in their life to bring them together and then to draw them um, to know you and then to teach them how to live. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just... Um, Show them a moment of your joy and your peace this week. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This week we have changes. So it's really fun to do announcements because I have something new to say. On Tuesday and Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we will be here for family time and for breaking chains, but we won't be there. We'll be here because we have grown out of that room and we can't fit anymore in. 
So we are moving out here so that we can have tables and room for everyone to join us. On Tuesday night, if you're joining us on Tuesday, we've started a little bit earlier with our meal. So at 5.30, we'll start eating so that Bible study can start right at 6. So that's our changes. That's exciting. Um, it's exciting to have something new. Uh, Saturday at 6 o'clock, we will be here in this room and in Kids City. And, of course, Sunday at 11, we are here. Some upcoming events. The Friday nights in February are full. That was fun. The Friday nights in February are full. So Friday the 11th, what? Oh, Joe said that's freaky, that the Friday nights in February are full. February 11th is Women's Night, and we are having a comfy pajama movie night. So put on your comfy pajamas that are nice and warm. You can bring your cozy blankie if you want to, and some movie snackies, and we will be here at 6 o'clock watching a movie. On the 18th, it is our traditional marriage date night. So if you are married and you and your spouse want to join us, we will be having dinner, Usually we have a devotional and a games that we play just as a chance for us married couples to enjoy our spouse and connect with other married couples. So the cost of that's going to be $20. Um, Heather's in charge, so I'm going to say if you want to come to marriage date night, you can talk to Heather. And on the 28th, it is men's night at 6 o'clock here. They just had men's night. So... This is my son telling me that it's not the 28th, because if Friday is an 18th, the next Friday cannot be the 28th. It's the 25th. Everyone take out your pen and change your bulletin. Oh, I'm looking at an outdated bulletin. Okay, so you guys are all up to date. You know everything. If you have any connection cards or address changes or anything that you want to update us on, Please do that on the back of the connection cards. Put your prayer requests and praises. Those go in the brown backs with your tithes and offerings. And that's all the changes for this week. So don't forget, Tuesday and Wednesday, out here. We've been hiding God's word in our heart from James for quite some time now. And we are at James chapter 4. And we're going to do all verses 1 through 4 this week together. So if you would read along. And at home, if you have an opportunity to grab your Bible and jump in with us so that you can read that. I did it wrong, didn't I? No, you see this? Okay. We're going to interrupt our regular scheduling, hiding God's Word in our hearts time for my wife, Tracy Collins. She's so beautiful. <laughs> Good time. <laughs> this is why I wanted to stay in bed this morning, you guys. I get back to my seat and Dawn says, um, Mom, you forgot the most important thing. And I'm like, what? She's like, uh, we finished Matthew. You guys, last week in Bible study, we finally finished Matthew. We've been in it for like forever. Woohoo! So not only are we moving out here, but we're starting a new Bible study that Joe says is only going to take us approximately four weeks. <laughs> For you on Facebook, everyone's laughing. Um, so supposedly it's only going to take us four weeks. We are jumping into the short book of Titus. So that's what's happening on Tuesday. Now we return to our regular scheduling program, hiding God's word in our heart. So those of you at home on Facebook had plenty of time to grab your Bible and um, to read through it with us. And it's going to be on the screen very quickly. There we go. James 4.1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. 
James 4, 1 through 4. Awesome. So, let's choose not to become an enemy of God, right? Let's be a friend of God's, not the world's. And, um, and that can be sometimes a challenge because we are used to the things that we grew up hanging around with. And you know what? God is, does this cool thing, okay? And, and I'm so appreciative because um, otherwise none of us would survive. He works on a few little things or one thing at a time in us. Like, how many of you are grateful for that? He doesn't just throw the book at you and go, Bruh, be perfect now. Bam. Yeah? I would go nuts because I am so messed up. Okay? And, and you don't have to laugh so hard, Trace. I just, I'm, I'm trying to be real here. Um, yes, amen. Um, <laughs> Uh, did you ever wish somebody didn't get out of bed? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's why I brought it. Oh, man, I am laughing now, and I can't hardly see my paper because I'm kind of at that laughing teary mode. Oh, bless God. I don't remember what I was saying. Something about something. All right. We're talking about marriage today. And um, I have a stack of books here that are um, they're in my office all the time. And I've not read all of them, or else I'd probably be a better man. Oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about, how I'm glad that God takes one little thing at a time, right? And, and he just kind of, um, it's kind of working away at making me who I'm supposed to be. Um, and my brain just kicked into 10 different ideas of where I could go that I wasn't planning on going, and I'm not going to go there. I'm going to stick here. So I have this pile of books, and some of them I've read. Some of them I've worked through with Tracy. Some of them I haven't read, and, well, most of them I haven't read, and I would probably be a better husband, and, um, and yet I don't have time to focus on that all the time, right? So... Um, this is just a sampling of the books that you could get. Um, I, you, you can go through the self-help section in, in Walmart, or you can go through the self-help section uh, at Olivet or whatever Christian bookstore is close to you, and just go down the aisle and... <sighs> right? There is so much to know, and so much of this is repeated information too, but... God has given us some very clear instructions and some very simple instructions that are very difficult to follow. Okay? Have you noticed that about God? He gives you very simple instructions. Like, take for instance, Adam and Eve. Don't eat the fruit in the one tree in the middle of the garden. One instruction, right? What do they do? They eat the fruit. And, and, and that's... You know, hey, that's your life too. I'm not going to throw myself under the bus completely here. That's your life too. One small instruction and bam. No, I'm going to go do it. Don't do this, do that. Do this, I don't do it, right? Um, love your neighbor as yourself. Are there any of us here who have completely loved our neighbor as ourselves? Okay, seeing no hands, I'll put mine down too. And... Um, yeah, so life is full of, of these simple instructions. Marriage. Love your wife. Wife, love your husband. And don't divorce. Now that's real simple, right? We have so many opportunities to love, so many opportunities to care but so many opportunities that go by the wayside because it's, it seems simple. The words are very easy to give. But there's this big thing that stands right in the middle of that, and it's I. It's me. It's, it's you. It's selfishness. 
It's called idolatry. It's putting me in front of everybody around me. So the, the instruction that God gave is that in, in Genesis chapter 2, that the two would become one flesh. Actually, no, it only says, it doesn't say the two. It says they will become one flesh. Jesus gives us clarity, and he says, hey, the two will become flesh, it, it, one flesh. It's not three, it's not four, it's not all everybody else. It's two, a man and a wife. One man, one woman. And um, there is a guy named William Luck, and I was reading his definition of what the Old Testament taught on marriage, and I'm, I'm just going to read it for you. It says, in short, the Old Testament taught that marriage was intended to be a permanent covenantal relationship between a man who was to protect and provide for his wife and a woman who was to remain monogamous to her husband means singly connected to her husband marriages between legitimate partners were insured by God that's a pretty good insurance policy wouldn't you say okay so they were insured by God before whom such were contracted. So there is a, a contract between a man and a woman. And that contract was, was set up so that it would be witnessed by you, by God, and by people. Okay? That contract was to be forever. Jesus says that Moses in the Old Testament gave room for a certificate of divorce because their hearts were hard. Now, well, think about what I just said a few minutes ago. The instruction was very simple, but there was one thing in the way, and that's I, me selfishness, idolatry. So much of our world today has an un shaky, uh, an, a shaky foundation, an unstable foundation, because the I factor, the selfishness factor came in. And there are places in this world where there are people who have solid foundations and they have that selfishness kind of slowly ex extracted so that people can be solid and steady and that should be the marriage relationship that you got to see when you grew up and that should be the relationship of marriage that we project to the world and that's not what gets seen and what gets experienced. And so when you look at this world, you have a tendency to think that's the way it should be. And I want you to know that the Genesis 2 standard that God laid out for us was not that. And it was a place of a firm foundation. It was a place of a glorious life. It was a place where life could be counted on. And so if you haven't seen that in your life and you look around and your parents and your grandparents, um, your friends, parents and grandparents and, and your friends and maybe your relationship is in a divorce situation, you haven't got to experience the firm foundation, the strength that God intended for your life. And you've seen what the I factor has done to your life. And you may feel like, why God did this happen to me? And in that statement is buried the I factor. It becomes again about me. And part of the shift that I talked about last week that we need to make in our lives 
is the shift from me to God. If my focus continues to be on me, then I end up continuing to perpetuate this shaky foundation, this broken system that the world around me has tried to make. And, and I have to say that it hurts me and it hurts you in ways that you don't even know. There's, there's a depth to the sub- stability of my family relationships because my parents chose to stay even through tough times. And my grandparents chose to stay even through tough times. My wife's parents chose to stay even through tough times. And her grandparents chose to stay through tough times. And she has chosen to stay through tough times because she deals with the I factor, me. Right? And I have chosen to stay through tough times. And I have to say there's a foundation there that's solid for my kids. There's a place for my kids to go, I don't have to always worry about what's going to happen. Are we perfect? By no means. And that's where we have to come and study in God's Word what we're supposed to do. And Mark, I'm going to jump to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm not sure what order I gave you. But I want you to hear some verses that are going to be they're going to be tough because you might look at them from your, from your vantage point, but they're going to be awesome because you get to see what a solid foundation starts to look like, and you can be the starting point for that. Now, from this moment, not, not past. Past is gone. We can't change it. But you know what? We can have a solid foundation. We can be a solid foundation as our attention goes off I and goes on to God. As our change happens, that shift happens, we can actually draw close to Him. Ephesians 5, 1 through 7 says, Just as in... Oh, well, no, that's the end of the verse before it. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Did you see yourself there? I do. I see myself there. And God deals with me, and He's weeding those things out. He's ruling in my life to transform me so that this is no longer me, but so that I'm a person that's worthy of to be a partner with in the fight for life, for stability, for truth in this world. I'm going to get through a little bit. That was just a setup for this. Verse 21. And we're going to read through 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, the same Christ who there before... um, gave himself up for us. That one. Okay. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, 
submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Let that play over a minute. Submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. I kind of wish he had put this second so that the first one comes because, you know, you're up here reading this and everybody's going, that submission word. But remember that earlier I talked about the apple and the simple instruction was don't eat, and not the apple, but the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what did Adam and Eve do? They both took and ate of that fruit. It's a simple instruction if you're going to follow it without the I involved. Okay, so here goes verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Okay? Really? Think? Think? Just as Christ loved the church. Now, wife, would you submit to someone who loved you this way? Is that worthwhile? Is that worthy? Is that a solid foundation? Is that a place of being okay with what that person chooses to do? Because if he was to love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word, this thing, through the Word, If you read all the good scripture verses, come down to God's word. I'll just tell you that. It's it's amazing. The 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 more I study God's word, the more I find out that just soaking in it and just letting it just wash over me will wash out the elements of impurity and wash in what it should really look like. And that's what I'm trying to say today is the I factor. That, that took the fruit and ate it, the I factor that makes marriages fall all over this nation, the I factor that makes difficulties for Tracy and I in my relationship to her, the I factor, if it is washed out and God's word is washed in and I start to have that solid foundation, then I can go ahead and love her like Christ loved the church and she can submit to me because I'm loving her like Christ loved the church And that brings something in our lives that does not crumble, does not fall apart, does not break. Okay? And so here's here's how we can hear these things without getting angry because we take the I factor out and we start putting the Christ factor in. And when the Christ factor comes in, it breaks us of all this selfish, hurtful stuff that says, no, I won't listen to you because you're a jerk. And we just forget to look at ourselves and see, oh, I just threw myself into that whole mix. And now we are in struggles over and over again. So let me continue with that. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and care for their body, feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. 
This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. I have to tell you that um, there are areas in my life where it has been very, very difficult for my wife to respect me. It's because when we go back to this concept of loving her as Christ loved the church, I was not in the right place. It's hard to respect somebody who is not loving you in the appropriate way. There are other areas in my life where I've served her faithfully, completely and totally, and it's respectable. And she has been able to respect me in that way. But there are areas in my life where God has continued to shape me and mold me into His image, making me to be the one who would love her as Christ loved the church so that she can learn to respect me in those areas. And it's a struggle. And it's a fight that's worth fighting. I think of the scripture that says, you've not yet struggled against your sin to the point of shedding blood. And there are areas, man, where, where God really just has to break us. And He has to take us to a place where we're willing to go there to the cross so that we can go there to our wife and love her appropriately. And being prepared for that is something um, is awesome. It is awesome. I've watched some men who love their wife and just went, wow, God is awesome. Look at that. Look at that. Have you had any examples of that? Where I was taken out and she was served the way God served us by sending His Son on the cross for us. It's an amazing thing. It's worth getting close to. It's worth hanging out with. It's worth, man, if you're single and, and you've been through some tough relationships, it's worth getting up and close to and just going, wow. Not to drive a wedge between the two but to learn how to be that selfless. To learn how to be like God through seeing that personal interaction. Last week I talked about uh, 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 and... um, one of the things that I had said um, was that if we are divorced, the only thing to that God gives us in remarriage is that if the spouse has been unfaithful. And um, I wanted to make sure that was clear because I think it kind of slid in there and it, and it didn't get fully clear cleared up. But that is what God said. And that's a hard teaching. And and maybe you've been through a broken relationship and you've gotten married again. And, you know, I don't know that for everybody, but it, maybe that's been you. And you need to, as I said, repent. And that repentance is to say, God, I came into the middle of that and Part of that was my fault. I receive that point and just say, God, I, I am to fault because I wasn't who I should be. Maybe you weren't at fault. And you were selfless. And that person did what they did to you. The Bible's clear as you go through the Old Testament that if you weren't at fault, that God sets you free from that. And um, 
the faithfulness issue needs to be that you continue to be faithful to Christ. You continue to follow after Him. But I had brought out the, the triangle where God was the top and the one spouse was on the one corner on the bottom and the other spouse was on the other corner on the other bottom and as we draw closer to God we draw closer to each other and I said this also relates to other relationships as you draw closer to God you can interact and um, I said sometimes that person's not willing to draw closer to God and I said you might change your relationship at that point I wasn't mean a marriage relationship Okay, I want to I want to make sure that's clear. I was talking at that point about relationships between other people. Okay, and and some people are just there dragging you back, and and they are not in a marriage covenant relationship with you, and you need to kind of leave them alone, while God deals with them, so that you can draw closer to God. Okay, in the marriage relationship, you're committed in covenant before God. And if you are breaking that relationship because of marital unfaithfulness of the other spouse, then you are free. But make sure that you weren't unfaithful. Make sure that you are prepared for God to fix what's broken in you. Because if you take that brokenness to another relationship and throw that brokenness at that relationship, it already starts from an unsteady foundation. It already starts from a place of pain. I was thinking about how marriage has changed. I gave that definition early. Um, But marriage now is viewed as a temporary connection between two people or even the other day I heard animals. There's a country in the world today that has made provision in law for a person to marry their pet. And it's just disgusting and wrong. It is not God's intention. Between two people or animals, whatever mix they want. Where each party gets what they want or they get out. Have you noticed that as you looked around? If I don't get what I want, I'm going to go elsewhere and get what I want. And that's what we have lowered this relationship that is covenant between two partners of the opposite sex that God made and designed to be a picture of him and the church. It is a relationship that has a, a, a eternal focus. No wonder we're disappointed by marriage. If I don't get what I want, I'm gone. And I'll go get it somewhere else. It's so temporary. Many people in marriage focus on the physical, how good it looks or how good it feels. Many focus on the material, how it provides for them. Many focus on control, how they get to manage or steer another. Many focus on the emotional, how fulfilled they can feel. Words like work, submission, yield, for the betterment of another, help meet, servant, provider, one flesh, are foreign to many of today's marriages. And God wants us to make our relationship something that's worthwhile, worth fighting for, worth working on, worth putting ourselves aside, taking the I element out and putting the we element focusing on Christ and, and coming close to Him in place. I want you to see what Jesus said about marriage in Matthew 19. Matthew is now the most beat up book in my Bible. 
It's not fully because this Bible is all the way through, but I spilled water on it. So I want to be fully in close or <laughs> disclosing that. All right, so we're Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees came to him, Jesus, to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And he said, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together not want, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Jesus was very clear on that too. But if you re, re, bleh, if you start right there at the first part of verse four, it says, "Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Hey guys, you're the Pharisees. You're the people who know the law. You know everything about the rules. Haven't you read? So many of us." are trying to live life with I as the focus and we haven't devoted ourselves to reading. What's the instruction manual say? So, soaking in this will alleviate the brokenness of this life. And it will make marriage something that you can grow into loving the way Christ has given us to love and shown us to love. And so, hey, maybe you're struggling in that marriage relationship today and, um, and it's been a frustrating, frustrating go. Is the I factor in or has the I factor been removed first? What did you replace the I factor with? Did you replace it with spouse? Because if you replace the I factor with spouse, you're in worse shape than the first place because they're going to fail and they're going to be worse and it's going to crumble. So if the I factor and the she factor has not worked for you, have you taken the she factor out or the spouse factor, I should say, because I'm doing it from my perspective, but have you taken the spouse factor out and put in the God factor? Because if you put in the God factor and you've leaned into him, then what she does is not going to totally destroy your relationship to him. And as you go closer and closer to him, it's going to be easier to bring your spouse along and to be faithful there. What is your focus? Have you gone into finding out who he is or have you tried to figure out who you are? That's putting the I factor into life. So many of us just are like, hey, uh, if I find out who I am, I'll be okay. People have done that for centuries and centuries and centuries and have found that they aren't enough to meet their own desires and needs. But when we get into God's word, when we get close to the perfection who God is, when we find out what it's like to be loving the way He loved, to be kind the way He's kind, gracious the way He's gracious, thankful the way He's thankful, if we find out what it's like to be in His presence, then we will be able to have relationship that's successful and that's great, not just okay. And so in the areas where you see me and you bump up against me and you find out that, um, that I know God and I'm close to Him and that He's in the right place in relationship with me, 
you'll find that it's just a beautiful experience. But when you start to grind into me and find out that I am I'm really putting God out here and putting me right in the center, you'll find that it's a very rough experience. It's not very exciting. And those moments are the moments that God's working to pull my attention away from myself and turn my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. But when he had died, buried, rose again, ascended into heaven because he was willing to suffer for me, God exalted him to the highest place and seated him on the throne where he will rule us and reign. He will express his love to us. And that love poured into me can pour out to my spouse. That love poured into me can ex- accept way more friction <laughs> than the love that I try and manufacture on my own. So in Jesus' name, I pray that your relationships would be centered here rather than here. That your relationships would be based on this rather than on your spouse, yourself, or whatever some guru says that this would be the central place that you go for your marriage advice. Not this. That Jesus would be the center so that life could be based off of His kind of love and that relationship could go where it needs to go. Jesus I pray that you would help us in this marriage understanding. That we could come to you and take off the I factor and put our focus on the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, that submission wouldn't be about what do I get out of it? How do I love the way you love? How do I serve the way you serve? How do I care the way you care? God, I pray that those who have experienced damaged relationships, whether it's their parents or grandparents, their friends and relatives, or their own personal marriage, that you would help them as they deal with the I factor that's been wounded and hurt and wants to hold on to control. I thank I thank you that you can heal that. I pray that you would. And that you would allow them to come to the love that you expressed on the cross. I pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, it's a song that I learned as a kid. Got I trouble, I trouble. Everybody's looking out for number one. Me, myself, and I trouble. What's going to become of all that I trouble? And if we can take the I out of this relationship stuff and put the Christ into this relationship stuff, the world will notice. You can see the difference between a good relationship that's, first of all, Christ-centered and secondly, submitted to each other. And in that relationship, there is hope for our great nation because we will fall apart as marriages fall apart. And we will be put together as marriages are put together. 
And that's a bold statement, but it's a true statement. And you'll find, if you look, that the solid foundation of marriage is where the, na the, the, the empires have fallen. Because marriages that are based on Christ and Christ that is in life and in relationships that are solid and, and strong will impact society in a way that makes it solid and strong. So, whatever you do, the bottom line instruction from today is take I out. Put Christ in and give that a go. You're dismissed.